Um, Phil, Phil Hodgson, CEO of Calix, uh, is not in the caravan today, as some of you uh, might have heard. Phil uh, was in London uh, just last week preparing to meet Prince Charles, of all people, which he'll, uh, he'll, he'll talk to, I'm sure, uh, but decided that morning that he felt a little bit unwell, so didn't visit uh, Prince Charles, and, and thank God for that, because uh, otherwise he would have been isolated for a, mu a much longer period. Phil, I'll throw it over to you. Um, we'll ha ask questions throughout. Um, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, we've got 30 minutes. Um, it's a brave new world of technology. Good luck, Phil. Excellent. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, welcome all. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks again, NWR, for organising uh, this type of uh, engagement session, which I think into the future is going to be the new normal. Uh, as Simon said, I've, uh, I, I self-isolated when I got back in my caravan. I disqualified myself from a meeting with Prince Charles, which uh, in retrospect is probably a good thing. Uh, he might have given it to me. Uh, I've been tested free, so uh, I'm free to roam back into the house now. There's going to be a bit noisy in the caravan, so I decided to do the presentation from inside the house. So, look, welcome all. Uh, just a quick introduction to... Uh, Calix. Uh, I'll also cover off uh, where we've got to to date, um, some recent uh, sort of updates to March, and also looking forward, uh, what do we expect to see and what are the key value drivers for the company moving forward? So uh, just on this first slide, what we've got here is, uh, is a little bit of a summary, I guess, of the equity and, and share price performance of the company. We listed the company in July 2018. Uh, you can see there, We've had, uh, in terms of the share price, uh, quite good support uh, and quite good share price performance. Uh, obviously, the last week or so has not been uh, fantastic, but I don't believe we're in any different company to most other shares on the market. But ultimately, the share price has held up fairly well because the fundamentals of the business are much the same. And so what I'll do is cover off those fundamentals and why we think uh, this business is uh, looking very good moving forward. You can also see there the equity structure. Uh, the board management of the company uh, sitting at about 17.5% and a lot of that is our own money that have, that's gone into this company. We also have a very good register. You can see their perennial value, value management. Uh, you can see Sculptor, which is Oxif. You know, there's a couple of individuals there, uh, Nicholas and Paul, uh, who've been in the company a long time and they're based in the UK. Uh, and also Thorny, Acorn and now Australian Super are also, also substantial shareholders in the company. So. Uh, so a very good register on the company. Also, uh, having listed in July 2018, you can see most of the shares uh, have now moved out of escrow. The only remaining shares in escrow are directors and promoters, essentially me and, and my fellow directors. Uh, and so really the, the free float of the company is quite substantial now. Just moving on, uh, just some investment highlights of the company. Uh, we're cash flow positive. Uh, we've got some growing revenues. I'll talk about the sales revenues that we're starting to generate, which are quite substantial. Uh, we're also exporting to eight countries, so uh, expanding footprint um, across Australia, US, uh, Europe, and Asia. Uh, we've got a good, strong balance sheet, zero debt, um, and uh, sitting at uh, over 28 million in net assets. Uh, the business is highly scalable, uh, and in a recent acquisition, we've just secured a US uh, company aligned with our own, uh, into which we're going to inject our technology. Uh, but automatically from December, that's starting to uh, flow through into our revenue performance. And so I'll cover that off as well. In terms of uh, uh, other highlights of the company, the technology that we have uh, has really attracted some great global partners. I've, I've got a, a snapshot there of a few of them, Solve, Semex, Heidelberg, Cement, Lust, Engie. Uh, and I'll talk about why they're interested uh, in the technology shortly. Uh, obviously, being a technology platform company, uh, we've got that technology protected. Uh, we've got multiple patents uh, and patent applications globally. Uh, and the other thing that we've been very successful at is funding our development pipeline. So we've raised substantial funds uh, to help develop the technology into different applications. Uh, we've got a great team. And as I say, we're personally invested. So a lot of the equity that uh, is uh, owned by management and staff and directors in the company is our own money we put into the company. In terms of the verticals that the company can address, the applications, uh, there's some in market. So water and wastewater, uh, aquaculture and freshwater lake remediations emerging. Uh, we also have some uh, products starting to move in through the pre-commercial phase in agricultural crop protection. 
and we've got some good funded R&D in uh, CO2 mitigation for the lime and cement industries, and also uh, advanced batteries. Uh, and you might uh, be wondering why uh, a technology company could, could be uh, sort of targeting so many different verticals. And when I talk about the technology and its application, um, that hopefully they'll give you a sense of why these verticals uh, are of interest to us. And of course, they're, they're huge verticals. Uh, each, each one of them are multi-billion dollar global opportunities for the company. Just to give you an idea of the um, uh, footprint, if you like, of the company, the business overview, uh, we've got operating sites all around the world, uh, distributors all around the world, and we've got a head office in Australia as well as Europe and now the United States as well. Uh, and so the sales revenues that we're starting to generate are really coming from our water treatment products. Uh, we're growing exports into Southeast Asia, mainly for aquaculture, but also uh, this recent US acquisition that I'll talk more fully about uh, is also very exciting with respect to growing our revenues. Uh, we have good control of our supply chain. So we have our own mine here in Australia, uh, our own manufacturing facility, uh, and we're moving all the way through distributors to end customers. Now our end customers are in the water treatment space, uh, utilities and food companies. Uh, and so in this sort of uncertain world of coronavirus, those are really essential services. Uh, and so we don't really see a threat to uh, our business given our supply chain robustness and the type of customers we have. The other thing that we have is a, a fairly quickly scalable business. All of the capital required, uh, the major capital required, has already been spent. And so really the organic uh, scale of our business is, uh, is, can be quick. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned before, a funded development pipeline. Uh, we've been very successful at raising funds for agriculture, advanced batteries. And in Europe, uh, we've recently been awarded another 16 million euro. That's 28 million euro altogether to develop our CO2 capture technology for the cement and lime industries. So uh, hopefully that gives you an idea of a bit of a business snapshot of, of this small Australian company with, with quite a global and growing footprint. Just in terms of some key financial metrics, uh, we're up uh, uh, half on half. We released our half year results uh, just over a month ago. Uh, we're up 39% uh, within Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia. And also the first month of our US acquisition has started to lay across those results. Uh, so overall, we're up in sales revenue 144% uh, compared to prior period. Uh, as I mentioned, we're very successful in getting new grant funding. We've uh, secured another 30 million just in the, in the first half of this year. Uh, the majority of that, of course, developed the CO2 project in Europe, which I'll talk about. In terms of our sales revenue, our guidance remains firm, 12 and a half to 14 million for this financial year. So we don't see an impact, uh, any material impact of coronavirus on our customers purchasing, uh, nor our supply chain, which we have secured. As I said before, we've got a good balance sheet, net assets, well over 28 million and zero debt. And we're cash flow positive from operations. Uh, and really, um, I guess uh, the key revenue jump piece, which is the completion of the acquisition in the US for a water treatment business there, uh, ultimately set to deliver about a five-fold sales revenue uplift, and that's based upon FY19. And that's already going to lay across quite substantially into this financial year, as I've said before. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the key financial metrics of the business. Just in terms of the core technology, uh, basically uh, it's a, well, what I've got here is uh, uh, the core of the technology, which is a tube. Uh, I've got a toilet roll here. This is probably more valuable than our tube right now. But ultimately uh, what we do is we heat this tube up to about a thousand degrees centigrade. Uh, it's about 22 meters high uh, and about 1.8 meters in diameter. So a little bit bigger than this, uh, but we take a raw ore called magnesite we have uh, our own mine uh, where we get this magnesite in South Australia, as I said before, and we grind that to a very fine powder, much like flour. Uh, and basically we just drop that down the tube. It just floats down the tube. And as that powder heats up, uh, basically all the trapped gases that are in this rock basically come out of the rock and it forms a powder, much like this. It looks a bit like flour itself. But if you had a look at the individual grain of that powder, it's extremely high surface area. It looks like sort of like a, a honeycomb shape uh, under very high magnification. Uh, 
And it's that very high surface area that gives us competitive advantage in various verticals. I'll talk about wastewater specifically this talk, but we're also in aquaculture, lake remediation, crop protection, advanced batteries. All of that has to do with making a very, very high surface area powder. Each one of these grains, as I said before, is like a, a little chunk of honeycomb, very, very high surface area material. But the technology has two advantages. The first is that very high surface area material that we can make. And the second, remember I said we grind this material up and just drop it down the tube. This material and also limestone, about half the weight of this rock is CO2 trapped in that rock. And of course, limestone is the major component in cement manufacturer. So uh, when you drop limestone down the tube uh, in a powder form, uh, what happens is the CO2 comes out of the limestone uh, and the, lime, the limestone continues to fall to the bottom and the cement and lime industries then make their cement and lime from that. But of course, having that inside a tube with the heat on the outside, none of the gases from the furnace mixes with that material inside. And so what comes out of the top of the tube is pure CO2. Now the CO2 that's trapped in a lump of limestone is two thirds of the emissions of a cement plant. Uh, and those two thirds uh, uh, effectively go to make up some 5% of global CO2 emissions. And that's why the cement and lime industries uh, are so keen on looking at this technology uh, as part of a CO2 mitigation strategy. Uh, and so that's the second bit I'll talk, spend a little bit of time in this talk about, uh, is talking about the CO2 capture uh, aspects of the technology and how that's progressing uh, in Europe, where we've got our major R&D on that part of the business. But first, let's talk about wastewater. First of all, in wastewater, uh, when we produce this powder, uh, we mix it with water and we form a slurry. You can hopefully see uh, in this little pack is, is some of this uh, slurry. It looks a little bit like paint. Uh, now, this material is used as an alkalinity in wastewater treatment, an alkalinity agent. Uh, and typically, uh, there's caustic and these sorts of agents that are used in wastewater treatment. Uh, but this particular one is about 30% more powerful than caustic. Uh, now, I'll just uh, squeeze a bit out there onto my finger. If I had done that with caustic, my finger would start to be dissolving away. Uh, and of course, uh, the reason why it doesn't is this stuff, despite being a more powerful alkaline, is much safer than caustic. And also, you couldn't do this with caustic. So that just proves how safe this material is. The main business that we've purchased in the US uh, is concentrated on caustic replacement for alkalinity in wastewater treatment. We've also got businesses here in Australia, of course, where we're doing much the same thing. We're also injecting it into sewers to help with the odor and also the fat control in sewers. You would have heard of fatbergs and these sorts of things that block sewers. So this particular product, uh, it really helps control the odor in sewers and really helps control fatbergs in sewers. The other thing that we can do is make a very stable slurry. Part of the reason this hasn't taken over from caustic soda globally is because just like paint that sits in your, in your shed for six months, it can settle out. And once it settles out, it becomes very hard to use and to pump around. So uh, what we've been able to do with our high surface area particles uh, and our technologies make a very stable product. We're currently exporting that product in this form to Southeast Asia, and in fact, in our uh, market entry into the US, uh, we were exporting the product again from Australia into the US. Uh, and so uh, this particular product, we can make in a very stable form. Uh, and that gives us competitive advantage because we can ship it long distances, open up new markets, and then build our manufacturing facilities in those new markets, basically to then grow our gross margins. The reason why I really like the United States and the, uh, the acquisition we've just made there uh, first of all, the United States has very poor uh, magnesium hydroxide. It, they can't ship at long distances. Uh, and so basically manufacturing in the US has been concentrated around those particular manufacturing facilities and not extended out further. What we get, our plan for the US is obviously to seed the market further with a much more stable slurry and then uh, progressively move to build our slurrying facilities and capture more of that market. We're currently sitting at about six to eight percent of the US market with the acquisition we've just made. Uh, now that market in the US is at least 100 million we think. Uh, and we're only sitting at six to eight percent now after the acquisition. Uh, in Australia, for example, we grew to 40 percent of the market in about four years with our slurry. And so we really see the US as highly prospective. 
what we've been able to do uh, since even our half-year results is the first US plant upgrade has been completed uh, and a more stable product has already been achieved there and we're underway on our second US plant upgrade on the businesses there now. So we're lifting up our technology and taking it into the US and starting to do that market expansion now. Uh, and in fact, the first US plant uh, that we're looking at to expand the market there uh, is already, uh, the key bits of equipment are already being purchased. Uh, we've already identified where that plant will be. And so really the US business is quite exciting. Uh, the acquisition has, uh, has, is delivering the synergies that we thought it would and delivering the strategic, I guess, advantage that we can see in the US. Uh, so it's going to be a very exciting period over the US in the coming few months. Longer term in the US, we want to partner with someone. Uh, partner with someone who does this, produces magnesite. And the reason why most companies that produce magnesite make refractories and they mine this stuff, they crush it down to put it through their kilns and anything that's too small won't go through their kiln because it'll just get blown out the top of the standard kiln. Of course, fines, the material that comes from the mine that's too small to go in their kiln, that's perfect for our technology. And so what we want to do is partner with a magnesite producer in the US, use their waste product or fines to make our high value product. And that'll just simply continue to allow us to grow our gross margin. So the US is a very exciting opportunity for us. The second opportunity I'll spend a little more time on is the CO2 capture uh, technology that we're developing in Europe. That particular technology, if you recall, instead of magnesite, we're starting with limestone. Uh, we've got a plant that we've now built at a Heidelberg cement site uh, in Belgium. And that plant has proven the technology concept. So we've built that with 12 million euro in EU funding. It's proven the technology concept and we're spending the remainder of 2020 uh, scaling that technology in terms of its uh, proof of operation and operational throughput. Uh, the EU though had seen enough evidence of the use of that technology to give us another 16 million. Uh, and so that's to build a scale up version, not just one tube, but four tubes. That'll take it to about 20 to 25% of the standard cement plant throughput. Uh, and so at that point, uh, if we complete that project by about 2025, uh, we'll have technology proven at scale. Even though it's only 20 to 25% of a cement plant, uh, that is sufficient for that cement plant uh, to start mitigating its CO2 emissions. And that's why we've got uh, some very interested parties in the technology like Heidelberg Cement, uh, Semex, uh, Lawast, some very major companies who are part of that consortium. Um, the other thing that uh, is driving these companies to do this with CO2, as opposed, uh, for example, from Australia, in the European Union, uh, there is a price on carbon. There's an uh, emissions trading scheme uh, that was sitting at around $5 per tonne of CO2 back in 2018. Uh, now, the price of a tonne of CO2 uh, in terms of a permit to, to emit that CO2 has jumped to well over 20. And it's done that because the EU have progressively brought down the cap of CO2 emissions 2.2% year on year from 2020 to 2030. So CO2 is really going to start to bite these companies uh, who can't mitigate that CO2. You can't cement without limestone and in heating up that limestone you release that CO2. So our technology uh, provides a way for those companies to capture that CO2. It's also quite a compelling technology in terms of its cost and capital. And the reasons why, I guess the Heidelberg cements of the world are interested in the technology, is uh, if this technology is proven at scale, uh, it will be uh, certainly a lot less than current technologies such as amines or end of pipe capture CO2 solutions, or even developing technologies, things like what's called oxyfuel technologies. Uh, and so our technology is positioned to be the lowest cost technology from a capital and operating perspective. So with this particular project, the key next steps uh, are to get the project agreement signed on the four tube module, the scaled up module, and to get that project underway. Uh, and that's happening fairly imminently in the next few weeks. So if I have a look ahead uh, at what uh, are the key drivers, I guess, of value for this business, um, certainly the US expansion is important uh, in the wastewater business, as I said before, we're looking at moving uh, and our guidance remains at 12 and a half to 14 million Aussie uh, for this financial year. And then a five fold uplift uh, to, well, to well around 18 million Aussie on an annualized basis. Uh, moving forward. 
But given the market opportunity there, of course, uh, our aim is to continue uh, a rapid growth uh, in the US as quickly as we can. In terms of things like aquaculture and freshwater lake remediation, I didn't cover those off in detail here, but it's a similar sort of uh, process. You are, you're adding alkalinity to water to help condition it. And in prawn farms in China, for example, uh, we're starting to get some good sales there early, but good. Uh, interrupted a little bit by coronavirus, but we've now had our first orders from China uh, post coronavirus. So we're hoping those Chinese sales start to pick up uh, for our water business uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, in terms of agriculture, and again, I didn't cover in too much detail this talk, uh, but agriculture, we've signed an agreement to do much the same product, same sort of product, just sprayed on a plant. Uh, it helps protect the plant against insects, pests. Uh, and when I talk about insects, they're very tiny insects like aphids and borers. It doesn't affect bees or ants, um, but it helps protect the, the, the plant against those types of pests and diseases. We've signed an agreement, uh, our first license agreement for that product, and we're looking to see our first sales from the EU. Again, small, and uh, um, in terms of the impact of coronavirus, we're unsure how that's going to affect it, but it's a first start and a first sale into the market for that particular product. Again, looking ahead on Lilac, getting these project agreements executed and getting Lilac 2 the four tube module underway uh, is something we want to achieve in the next few weeks. Uh, and then the batteries uh, part of the business, again, which I haven't covered in detail here, but again, it's about those very, very high porous, tiny particles. We've been given altogether around five million Australian dollars from the Australian government through various schemes to start to build our advanced battery technology. Uh, and it's for using these particles in a cathode of a battery. Um, and so the high porosity helps the lithium ions get in and out of the battery more easily. That's basically what we're trying to achieve uh, with that ap application of the technology. So overall, uh, the, the fundamentals of Calix have, have not changed. Uh, our business remains robust even in these times with the types of customers we have and with the supply chain security we have. And our advances uh, in terms of the research and development to continue to develop these other really interesting applications of the technology are funded from government and continue to be funded from government and are progressing as well. So uh, overall, the business is uh, still looking as robust as it did three months ago, uh, and we remain very positive for the outlook, outlook for the business. Thank you very much. So Simon, I, I can't see the screen. Have we got any questions? Uh, no questions submitted. You've you've been too comprehensive, Phil. Been too comprehensive. <laughs> Happy. To, I'll I'll stay on the line just in case. Uh, just in case there's any questions come through. Just compliments. That's all, Phil. Just compliments. That's all, Phil. No, no worries. Well, you I'll just, leave you. There you go. Have you got so Michael's, Michael's just come through. Just so Michael's just come through. Oh, sorry. Yep. Uh, just, uh, just wondering what is going on to be. What's going to be the main area of focus for this financial year and next? This financial year and next. Okay, main areas of focus definitely the U.S. growth uh, is uh, growing that top line sales revenue. Uh, taking advantage of our technology uh, put into that business in the US uh, to really try and grow that as quick as possible. There's a lot of uh, headroom uh, for that business to grow in the US. So uh, that's that's the main focus. Um, along, of course, with Lilac, which is the CO2 capture in Europe, that's moving ahead very quickly. Uh, and so uh, getting that project up and running, uh, completing the current Lilac 1 project to its full testing, uh, is is a big focus for us. So uh, those two things, I think, will be the main drivers of, uh, of value, I guess, for the company over the next sort of six to 12 months. And just the last question there from Reese, Phil, yeah, the how's the tech position against competitive carbon reduction technologies? against competitive carbon reduction technologies. Yeah, so in terms of the application in cement and, and lime, uh, I mentioned what's called amines, which is a technology uh, that's basically a chemical plant you put at the end of the flue gas stack to capture the CO2. 
Uh, that's widely recognised to cost around 80 euro per tonne of CO2 captured. Uh, there's also uh, a technology being developed, never demonstrated even at pilot scale, called OxyFuel. That's where you burn, all your burners are pure oxygen, not mixing it with nitrogen and those sorts of things to create a higher purity CO2 stream. That technology is widely regarded to be around the 40 euro per tonne, but never demonstrated at a pilot scale. Our technology uh, at current CO2 prices, uh, Heidelberg Cement uh, have publicly said that our technology looks compelling at those types of prices. Obviously the technology needs to be scaled up and proven, uh, but they're the sorts of numbers, the 20 to 25 euro per tonne, we're aiming to be under. And just the final one there from Michael. Okay, oh, sorry, I can just see the questions coming in now. Um, sorry, <laughs> Phil Carey, friends. what's the bear's name? I, I don't know, I have to ask my wife, Phil. I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. Uh, next ask one, boss. Michael, uh, sorry, second question. When do you expect to see revenue from CO2 project? Actually, they're already earning revenues now. So the grant uh, that we have in the uh, EU is paying Calix plus a little bit of margin. So those grants are very good for our business right now. Of course, uh, once the technology is proven, the business model is more around uh, a licensing or royalty type revenue stream. Uh, so really that's from 2025 onwards that we'd be looking to have those types of commercial revenues coming in. Of course, the technology could be monetized or uh, given value before then. As it de-risks, uh, there could be equity interest in the technology from, from big players and, and maybe not cement and lime companies who, who are really technology buyers, uh, but companies that are in the engineering technology space who currently uh, put technology into the cement and lime companies. Uh, companies such as IKN, who we're working with um, on uh, Lilac 2 in Europe, uh, and who have uh, a commercial tie-up with a company called Sonoma, which is one of the largest Chinese engineering technology companies. Uh, so there'll be, um, I guess, a few value uh, points that could take place even before the, the technology is fully commercialised. Done very well, Phil. Um, definitely the best question of lot from, uh, from Phil Perry there on the bear. Doesn't feel very bearish today. Pardon the pun. That's a good one. Um, we'll finish up there, Phil. Thanks so I'll much. Get back to Phil uh, on that. Make it. Exactly. Thanks so much for making it nice and easy. today. And if, if there's any questions, um, details are on the bottom of Calix's release as mine. Um, let you go in peace. Thanks so much, Phil. Let you go in peace. Thanks so much, Phil. No problem. Thank you very much.